Okay, welcome to the Cube Pod episode 57. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Hey, John. Knows every, every week we get the pod. Dave, I'm in Boston remote at an Airbnb on Charles Street in Boston. My son Tyler is graduating from Northeastern in ComSci and Music, so I'm here for the week here in Marlboro Studio right up the road. Not, I'm not in Palo Alto, so we're kicking off a little road show here. Um, it's been fun, fun, fun to go to that, but great great week of stuff to go down. You were in New York from MongoDB. Great to see you. Yeah, I was. New York was great. It was at the NYSE, hanging out with uh, Trinity and Brian, and uh, psyched to see everybody next week at RS, RSA, RSAI. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff going down. Great, great uh, job, by the way, seeing you and, and Stock Exchange doing those, doing that analysis. A lot more coming to for that for, with the Cube in, uh, in New York. With more of that coming on later. But Mongo had a great show. We got RSA next week. We got, we'll, we'll be in uh, Boomy World as well in Denver. I'll be there. Um, a lot of great stuff going on, Dave. Tell me about MongoDB, obviously doubling down on AI and RSA right around the corner. What's the quick hit on on what's going on in Mongo? Well, so, uh, well, first of all, I, I rang the bell with the Vikings, $11 billion IPO at, on the floor of the NYSE. And then we took over Jim Cramer's Mad Money set, did a hit on on Tesla and EVs and in that market, four hundred billion dollar market, growing a twenty two percent CAGR, you know, well over a trillion. Talking about China and and uh, and U.S. competitiveness and FSD, so that was cool. Mongo, Mongo was all about. They developed this application framework. They brought in all the hyperscalers, brought a bunch of LLM vendors, a bunch of startups, and you know, Mongo plays as you know uh, at the top layers of the stack. There's infrastructure, there's tooling, and and and, and LLMs, and then there's uh, then there's applications and they play in the second and third layer. So that map, it's the MongoDB application AI program brings in all those elements that I just talked about and really is how they're, you know, adding value to that ecosystem. So it was really good. It was a big developer show. You've been there. You did it last year. I did it two years ago. It's a one day event. They do 23 of these around the city. They go belly to belly with the, uh, with the developers. You know, really good event, a lot of momentum. They didn't give a lot of short-term guidance. They had, I snuck in at the financial analyst meeting for a little bit, uh, but I sat down with uh, Dave Itachiria, and uh, yeah. he and I were riffing and gave him the idea for my uh, my Twitter poll, and uh, which is 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 Nvidia, are they Cisco or are they Google? <laughs> From I, wish, I want to get I want to get into that because I think I st stuck a nerve with some folks on my my response. I said they're. <laughs> They're not Google. They're Cisco all the way. They're a chip company, not a software company. <laughs> and Sar Sar G was like, "Wait a minute, you've got about CUDA. We'll get into that." Um, I mean, that was an interesting poll, Dave. What could do now? What do you think? I mean, Nvidia, Google. That was a great poll. Explain the rationale and why you gave that poll. Yeah, got so kind of engage, ton of engagement on Twitter right now. So if you think about it, if you go back to ninety nine two thousand, Cisco was the most valuable company in the world. That people talk about picks and shovels. So it was Cisco. It was EMC, Sun Microsystems, Oracle databases. And so, and then of course you had all these other firms like Lycos and, you know, AOL was the granddaddy of the internet. I'm laughing because they kind of a joke to think to say that, uh, but at any rate, you know, and then, and then the dot com blew up and then who made it through the knot hole, Google, Amazon, you know, eBay, all the social media companies that came, you know, seven, eight years after the, and then the iPhone came. So, so the, the question that we were riffing with Dave at the Cheerio was, okay, are they, is is nvidia which is the granddaddy now of ai are they cisco that will you know great company but maybe become just an okay you know great company but not the greatest company in the world or are they google the most profitable entity in the history of entities i would say i think dave kind of agreed that i would lean more toward google you somewhat disagreed only because of the software factors i think they got a big moat i think mm -hmm. they got a monopoly that has legs what was your rationale yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, Nvidia has been saying for many years. By the way, I haven't been truly really disagreeing with the the narrative and the conjecture from Nvidia. We're a software company. I mean, hardware companies are basically software companies. I mean, I I would endorse that 100 percent because software is runs everything. But they are in the hardware business. They are in the chip business. They are a GPU company. They make systems that involve hardware and chips, and so. To say that they're a software company is 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 ridiculous, in my opinion. Now they may hire a lot of software engineers, but their entire core company is about the GPU, more horsepower, of which software powers it. But they charge specifically everything around that by the GPU. 
Now they say that's our blanket pricing. So let's not kid ourselves. NVIDIA is is a chip company. So if their chips aren't deploying, they don't make as much. Now I think the software is a moat. So clearly, let's understand that's a fact. Now, and if Jensen wants to debate that, I'm happy to debate that with him. Um, and we'll just come to the same conclusion. You're a chip company. You're a hardware company. Let me ask you a question. Software. Has a lot of software. Google is absolutely an interface company. They have a consumer business. They have an applications business. They have huge infrastructure behind it as well that powers it. Um, you you know, confusing their core competency with their business are two. You can't do that. So to me, that's the distinction. It's a very nuanced point, but their business that they're in is different than their core competency. So you could say Google has software, sure. They got also big data chops in terms of analytics and also hardware. So you know, it, it's it, it. You can slice this any way you want, but the bottom line is you cut right through the the, the hype and you look at how they make money. Wait, wait. And what, so what I gotta ask you. So, so and I, and it's a good point you're making. But what if I did? What if the question were this? How would you have answered? What if it was Nvidia, Cisco, Nvidia's Google, Nvidia is Apple? How would you have answered? Well, I Hardware think they can software. be. I would. I would say they're not yet Apple, and I think that's their opportunity. So, if I had to say coming out of GTC, their opportunity is to become Apple, and I would say that Apple was a um, a laptop company before the iPhone and before the iPod. So, what happened was is that they pivoted to obviously devices with the iPod and the iPhone, and then ultimately the App Store. Are they the? Are they an application business? Is Apple an applications business? No, but their app store is a key moat in that. So I would c- compare CUDA to like app store if you want to kind of draw the competitive strategy linkages. But they're still in the business of consumer devices, mainly the iPhone, and they make a ton of ton of dough. They're highly nested, a lot of leverage. That's Apple. Cisco was the connective tissue and hardware that connected the internet. I mean, buildings together, companies, and routes. So they had two businesses. They had uh, devices that connected major networks together that ran the public internet as well as connected businesses. And I think what made Cisco great was that they had such an inimitable uh, competitive entrenchment with connecting buildings that their switching costs were so high at that time, no competitor could displace Cisco because the opportunity cost to replace them would be eight weeks of planning, tons of conditions, the cost to like go to a better box the, there wasn't as much value to, um, to to justify the switching costs. Hence, Cisco never was replaced ever. Hence, why they have the monopoly on networking. So, NVIDIA has got the networking monopoly. I mean, the GPU monopoly right now. And so, I think they look more like Cisco because they have that core presence that has massive moat potential. Meaning, it's hard to replace the GPUs with NVIDIA because, frankly, they're great and they have the software behind it. Just like Cisco had, you know, routing a software that would make sure cache coherency, all that technical stuff would work. And so they are more like Cisco today. And I and, and Google completely was a completely out in the left field. They become an application for the internet. Okay. GP, uh, GPUs are not the application for AI. They enable it. So Cisco enabled the internet. NVIDIA enables uh, AI and generative AI. So I think the application of what Google was was a function of being on top of the internet. So there, that's why I weigh on Cisco. Your point about Apple is very strong because like if I'm NVIDIA, they're basically saying, come to our, quote, AI factory. Use our uh, NIMS or APIs. That's an Apple play. That is a lock spec. If they do that, that's a good move for them. So I love that strategy, but it's just not guaranteed. No, it's just it's not a, guaranteed. of course, it's, all, it's so good. That's why it's such an interesting question. This is way more detailed and nuanced than what Dave and I talked about. But but to summarize our conversation, I, I you know, Cisco, definitely hardware. They didn't have software. His point was Cisco allowed you to get on the internet, but it wasn't transformative. What was transformative is what happened later. Uh, and, and with, with Amazon and, and shopping and, and Google, obviously in search that was transformative. And the piece about Apple, I think is hardware and software together and transformative. So that's the question is, I agree. I think that's that. No, they can be. And I think that's what why GTC was compelling because they made a bold move and made a bold claim to put a major stake in the ground saying our AI systems and our AI factory, of which the likes of Dell and others have been co-opting that term. It's a great term. I love that term, by the way. So what they're, what they're saying is that there's a new infrastructure category, hence the iPod, iPhone, App Store, okay, versus a Mac, and that's it, mobile device. 
So I think yeah. that's a good play. It's just not it's just not yet guaranteed. So I think that's why the competitiveness, to, to quote Jeff Bezos, your margin is my opportunity, is that play here because that's really what's happening. There was, and that's why everyone's running because NVIDIA just said, we're going to go for this. Now they have a huge lead. That's a bit, another big discussion point. How far of an advantage does NVIDIA have over the others and can anyone catch up? The other, the other nuance. Very, that's, an, that's an interesting discussion right there. The other nuance here, notwithstanding the consumer versus the 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 enterprise, is you, you've got you got Apple was doing you know laptops, you know Nvidia was doing gaming, and then crypto. Now all of a sudden, it's one of the most important companies in the world. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look at this is going to be. We have a lot of things going on in this market that's we're going to squint through and, and connect dots on. I think you know the 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 new normal that's emerging with Gen AI is is not normal in the sense of it's hard to predict what's going to happen because it's, as Jensen said at GTC and from NVIDIA, it was right on the money. Generative AI is a new category. It's a new capability that's going to change the infrastructure. And this is what we've been saying on the cube is that it's going to change and flip the script on how the traditional hardware, middleware, and app layers emerge. And you got reInvent when we sat down with Adam Selesky, they were very clear. There's a three-layer stack, if you will, on this modern you know, Gen AI stack, categorically, it's the same as the old stack. You know, it's like you know, hardware, middleware, applications, but it's different. It's going to look different. It's going to be configured different, and it's going to have to be designed differently. That's why all the innovation right now is on the hardware side, and that's slowing down the application market. And what came out of MongoDB event is the realization that uh, a big billions of dollars of, of business that they're doing is about to explode larger, but it's on stall pattern right now. It's on a waiting, it's a, it's a waiting game. The infrastructure is not yet ready for mass scale of generative AI applications. If you look at the CapEx numbers by the major hyperscalers, they're all running as fast as they can to tool up. And that's where the game is right now. It's a consumer game first, and then it'll be an enterprise game. And that's where we are. Everyone's trying to figure out what's going to happen is all the VCs are going to start to say, wait a minute, our funding these companies are not getting any revenue. That's going to be a, a thing that's going to happen next. You're going to start to see immediately, probably in the next three months, bitching and moaning from either the financing side of it, from the VCs to the startup saying, where's the beef on revenue? Uh, and what's going to happen is the enterprise is not yet open for business. Yeah, there's some dollars there, but not scalable dollars. The money's going to be on the consumer side first, just like the internet, and then the enterprise. Uh, and I think it's going to take the same turn. That's why I like your analogy of Google and Cisco, because they were major players during that revolution. And again, the plumbing got had to get nailed down. Then the applications sat on top as the adoption of the Internet evolved. And that's why Google popped up years after the Internet started, because it was really, really good software. So I think right now we're in the same boat. It's going to be embryonic and it's going to continue to evolve with more capabilities, more functionality as the infrastructure gets better. So oh. great poll. And I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation. Then it's going to be like, okay, who's making money? What's the business model? <laughs> I think that's a really important <laughs> point that you're making. And I, I touched on this last week. Remember I said, we said, put a pin in it. I want to come back to that, but there's a, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of differences with com. But one of the similarities I see, even though there's a lot of differences in, in even in this similarity is that you had all this money sort of within this little insulated uh, echo chamber of tech, right? So you had, VC money going to companies that were doing portals and building data centers and building um, uh, internet service providers, and they were buying mm -hmm. servers from Sun. They were buying Oracle databases, storage from EMC, Cisco routers, and switching. and And the money was just flowing back, back and forth, back. And then they were advertising on Yahoo. And then all of a sudden, when the money dried up, they were like, "Uh oh." And everything stopped. Remember Ed Sanders said, <laughs> yeah. anybody want to buy a server? He was the CEO of Sun at the time. So there's a similar dynamic here, but it is different in that you have all this money sloshing around from these hyperscalers. You know, another big difference is the build out of the internet was from guys on, that were in massive debt like Enron and Global mm -hmm. Crossing, and they all went out of business. But today you've got the hyperscalers that are spending tons of dough. They're buying, mm -hmm. they're laying out all this CapEx. They're paying money to NVIDIA. That's going to other startups that are then doing training on uh, like Anthropic, which is which is taking money from Amazon. It's going back to a Amazon in the form of, of of training for for compute. And so you have this sort of similar insulated thing 
where and there's more money now does it eventually all blow up and the music stops i, I think probably i can't predict when but these things are very cyclical and then people step back to your saying like where's the money and then uh oh and then people get disillusioned the headlines come out is ai just a fad and then all of a sudden you know the next google the next amazon the next ebay the next meta come rocking right that's yeah, just I mean, going to happen I, well, I mean, you're, you're basically predicting the bubble bursting, which happened at the dot-com uh, internet era. And, and I think for the folks that weren't around, and half the people, actually three-quarters of the people that are in this AI wave and are on all sides of the ecosystem have not been around to understand that history, which is important. Now, there is a bubble in AI. It's a good bubble, in my opinion. It will burst, but it won't have the impact um, uh, as much as the dot-com bubble that when it burst in 2001, some say it was most it was the most um, dramatic nuclear winter of any kind of ecosystems entrepreneurial uh, environment, which happened because of the hype of the valuations. No one understood what it meant to run a business on the internet. They just loved the idea: deliver pet pet supplies. That's that's going to happen. Food delivery, everything that was hyped up in the dot com bubble day actually happened. It just happened downstream. So that's the same exact thing that's going to happen with AI, to your point. You're going to see a lot of things pop. But at the end of the day, when you have a category shift, as Jensen points out, like the Internet was a shift, that's a complete repaving over old ways of doing things. So what happens is the innovation comes from how you engage with those old methods. So if the metaphor was delivering groceries to your home, which was Webvan, but many had pets.com and Webvan, two of the most iconic flame outs of all time, it happened. I got DoorDash, I got Instacart. I Chew, you got pet Chewy. Chewy. Chewy is pets.com. The storage networks, that was the cloud. Storage networks, remember <laughs> SNI, Peter Bell's company? That was the cloud. Those <laughs> and people lost their shirt. They lost their pants. They lost their underwear. They lost everything on those deals. Okay. <laughs> but it all happened. But okay. it was fun. The, <laughs> the same thing is going to happen now with AI. Everything that's being looked at as a good idea is going to happen. The question is timing. Is there infrastructure to support it and whatnot? Now, why I think we're in a different bubble and it's not going to be as bad of a nuclear winter as, say, the dot com bubble is because we have the existence of major power dynamic in the industry. And that's the hyperscalers. Amazon Web Services, Azure, Google, Oracle, and others, right? These cloud players represent a huge stability factor and also a supplier factor. But the agility and the elasticity of these clouds will provide, I think, a slower a cushion, if you will, from a landing, soft landing standpoint on the bubble. So I think what we'll see here is you'll see some controlled churn on startups and companies that fail because they just don't have their economics right, product market fit, team risk, all the risk factors go into it, timing. That's where it's going to happen. But you'll see a lot of, a lot of people flame out. You'll see some things not work out for those reasons, not because uh, of the market opportunity. And I think Gen of AI is going to be interesting to see who gets it right. And I think the good news is the startup costs are significantly lower than before. So it'd be very, very interesting. Again, we'll watch it different. That's why where the money comes from, seeing where the production workloads are, and where the monetization is. That's why I like the MongoDB event, because it's a tell sign, in my opinion, that the app players, when that bit flips, you'll see a massive Cambrian explosion of apps when the infrastructure is truly ready. And NVIDIA is going for it. Okay? So is Google, by the way. So Cisco, I don't see them having a play here. I, don't, I just don't see them with a real AI enablement model yet. So, um, and I'm sure at Cisco Live, they won't have anything that's be compelling um, at least from what I see, I don't see anything compelling coming out of Cisco saying, wow, they're truly enabling a revolution, not like they did with the internet. So maybe the NVIDIA will be Google and NVIDIA, but I think they're definitely more like Cisco wanting to be Apple. Um, yeah, I don't know about you know, Cisco. I know Chuck's kind of doing the rounds now saying, hey, we missed the cloud. We're not going to miss AI, but it's still, still coming in the Splunk, focus. Splunk, Splunk is not AI, right? That's no, not God, no, strategy. no, no, no. Splunk is yeah. data and you know, logs and well, it, it and, enables some AI action. But that's not going to move the needle. Yeah. I mean, it's not AI. It's, it's, it's definitely, I mean, then that's why he, Chuck's always talking about how, you know, people don't want pretty dashboards. They want security basically implying that Juniper and Mr. Uh, uh, Juniper has basically got pretty dashboards with its AI <laughs> um, with mist. But so, I, you know, Cisco has AI. It's just it's it's kind of dispersed. But um, 
anyway, uh, interesting week, interesting conversation, John. I appreciate you yeah. uh, chiming yeah. in. I love it. No, it's got a great, it's got great engagement on Twitter. I mean, it's, it's spawned multiple threads. I saw it has a lot of, it's, it's, you're, you're the father of um, a bunch of divergent threads on Twitter on that one. It created great conversation. And, fr- and frankly, it's, it's a worthy debate because we can learn a lot because it gives us an understanding of where we are. And if you look at the analysis out there right now across the industry, people are confused. I mean, I, I was watching, um, um, the commentary on CNBC around the earnings. And it's so funny how everyone's just like, they're, they're not, they're not really peeling the onion back on what it is. It's just all hyperbole in terms of an analyst coverage and specifically AWS and the recent earnings and Apple specifically and others, you're starting to see all this, like this armchair quarterback, but they're like one day, <laughs> like one day of analysis. There's no, there's no like longevity in the, in the scope that tells me that this market is really confusing. to most of the mainstream, uh, journalists, the mainstream press, and the analysts. So, uh, Dave, I really think this is a historic time, and 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 this idea of short short focus. Okay, you're seeing so much short view thinking. Okay, um, I saw um, 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 Daniel Newman on 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 CBC. Don't never put money into Apple. <laughs> like, come on, really. They, 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 that's like saying I won't put money in Amazon. Apple is one of the best companies in the world right now, and so obviously the stock's up massive. He was wrong on that one, but he's he's got he's not an analyst. Okay, he's not a financial analyst. He's he doesn't even know their business. He's reading uh, headlines. I, so, I learned a long time so, ago. I I don't like to make calls before a company and announces earnings. <laughs> I mean, I look at the data and I say, well, there's momentum. But you know, a, a friend of mine. Who took over C- uh, as, as CFO of a company called Miniscribe? I've, I've talked about them before. They're the company who shipped bricks around the block yeah. at Longmont and then stored the bricks in, in inventory and counted them as inventory. And they broke into the lock boxes and they changed the numbers. Yeah. He said to me when he took over, he goes, "Dave, yeah. what's a company's profit?" And I said, uh, "Well, it's you know, it's, it's revenue minus expenses." He goes, "Nope, it's whatever they yeah. say it is." So I learned a long time ago. <laughs> I had some, um, I mentioned Mongo. I had some great uh, conversations with some dot connectors this week at MongoDB. I had um, Sanjeev Mohan came on the cube with Carl Olufsen from IDC. Sanjeev, he, Sanjeev's a former Gartner analyst, and he's like one of the most humble guys I know, even though he's got one of the best brains. You know, a lot of Gartner analysts are, you know, they're, they're, their track record or their reputation is they're, they, they can kind of be, they can kind of be tough on the vendors. And they they have the voice of the customer, so they can do that. Sanjeev is so smart, and and just really on point. He is a dot connector. He understands technology. He understands business. He understands trends, and he his his analysis is outstanding. And of course, Carl Carl's like he's like the grandfather of the <laughs> database analyst. I mean, he really knows his stuff. He's been been in the in the business for a while. Yeah. He understands the technology. So some really great conversations there. And Holger. You know, I mean, I, I was sat next to Holger during. By the, the way, on, on Carl, I'm, I'm, I'm real sorry. On Carl, I loved your comment. Oh, Carl, you're a VP at IDC. He's like, yeah, but you're like, I don't, you don't have to manage anyone. I like that little inside baseball <laughs> yeah, of IDC some... co- comments you you mentioned. That's right. IDC is kind of like a bank. They got like a hundred uh, VPs, maybe more. Like they're called research vice presidents. Floyer was one. I actually started when I was there because you know you had. You had inflation, you had title inflation. You wanted to give people raises who were hanging around to us. So they created this thing called research VP, which means that you're, you know, a legit analyst uh, and you got a VP title. And I think, you know, Gartner might call it fellow. I'm not sure, but you don't have to manage anybody. So it's an ideal situation. And then in Holger, Holger's always got the good quips. Anything, Holger's good. I like Holger because anything you say, he'll give you a contrarian um, opinion. You know, you say, hey, I think X. And he'll go, yeah, but. It's really why, and here's why, and you debate him, and he can he can go toe to toe. I'd like to see you two go toe to toe because you could go toe to toe with like Trump. You're that good. <laughs> well, look at I mean, you know, I've been around the block and in, in tech, and you know that. And the thing about it, we've been both historians. And that's the key. To, I think what what we see right now, being on the front lines here, is that we're we're in a great opportunity. I tell you, I I was just at the Northeastern uh, Computer Science Commencement. And the uh, dean over there, she's amazing. She came from Georgia Tech, worked at Park back in the day. She just delivered probably one of the most prolific uh, speeches uh, that was right on point. 
she hit a home run. I mean, you know how we talk to company CEOs all the time about messaging and keynotes for events. Um, she hit a home run. And the computer science these days are graduating students that literally started during the pre the pandemic, graduated this year, okay, um, with you know, and with all the protests, thank God they cleared out all those, um, you know, hired guns that came in and tried to fuck up graduation of these these students. Um, but you're talking about graduating a whole new breed of computer scientists. And by the way, the academic curriculum has now increased the aperture with kind of sidecar degrees. So computer science, music, computer science, biology, computer science, economics, a lot more. And then you get the pure CS, comp sci. So you're seeing a much more bigger group of comp sci's coming out. But they're going into a world of generative AI where the leveling up now is going to be completely fast. So everything they learned two years ago, almost fundamentally, is going to be obsolete except for the core theory, right? So the core problem-solving, creativity, core theory is going to play well into the generative AI. So she hit a home run. She hit the public tech stack, ethical, uh, ethical AI. She didn't overplay it. Just... So smart. And, and, and what we're going to have to watch now is that this is the next level of entrepreneurship. And it's good. the VC market right now is trying to figure out how to do seed deals on what a good team looks like. And so I was thinking and in, in listening to that keynote, we're living in an era now where the entrepreneur formation of these teams is going to be maybe two, three people. Not, And by the way, they can run that team for six months on 250 to a million dollars in capital. And absolutely nail it without hiring and standing up a lot of stuff. Now, again, to your point, Amazon, these hyperscalers are in play to help them, NVIDIA and others. This is a huge shift in entrepreneurship. And I think the capital markets are not yet ready for it. So, you know, I'm going to put a stake in the ground, put a marker on this for future conversations, is what is the, uh, the entrepreneurial equation for the next venture creation? Okay, like the Internet. And Web 2.0 kind of was the Web 1.0 bubble kind of comeback. We saw Facebook come out of that. We saw all these big companies, SaaS companies come out of it. So where where will this AI foundation lead us from an entrepreneurial new venture creation standpoint? And then what's the team makeup look like? And then how much AI is going to be involved? So I found it fascinating. They're going to have a much more diverse populace of entrepreneurs on the street, uh, not just your hardcore Cal grad or Stanford grad or Carnegie Mellon comp sci grad, you're going to have a much more diverse populace of entrepreneurs. And that point that she's making about critical thinking is, is important, right? Cause things change so fast. People can't keep, keep up with it. So, you know, you come out with skills, you know, remember <laughs> being a netware engineer was a big thing when we were kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, well, you know, the pattern, uh, the, the problem with the entrepreneurship equation in comp sci has been pattern matching problem. Oh, did you go to Cal? Did you go to Berkeley? Did you go? I mean, uh, Carnegie Mellon, show me an algorithm, show me this. Now you, you can solve a problem and scale it. You were, you're in the money and then scale can be defended. So we're going to see uh, a lot of false positives. And, and, and circling back to your point at the beginning was in the dot com bubble, the, the, the false positives were, oh, yeah, web van. What a great idea. The false positive was not the idea, it was the execution. Yeah. So they just couldn't stand up the infrastructure to do it. The didn't have the economics. Right? The economics, it, it was just, it yeah. didn't work, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. like I said, I mean, Peter Bell had a great idea. Uh, I'm going to create a company called Storage Networks, but we're going to have you know storage on demand. Storage is a service. The problem was the storage is all the same storage that was in your enterprise. It was EMC storage and compact storage and HP, whatever you, whatever you wanted. And so it was just not economical until Amazon came around and said, well, that doesn't work. We're just going to take off the shelf components. We're going to write our own software. We're going to automate everything. And we're going to take all the cost out and, you know, take away that 10 X markup and, and, and change the game. And so, all right. So Dave, we, right got, idea. We, got, you, we got, we got RSA coming up. Uh, uh, Ed Sim wrote a nice tweet. I retweeted it. It's RSA AI time, meaning AI, RSAI, artificial intelligence, because of the massive focus of AI at RSA. Looking ahead, RSA conference next week, the Cube, Silicon Angles team coverage will be covering all the news on site. I'll be in Denver for another event. Um, we have a partnership with NYSC. We're having an event on Monday night at Lamar with CISOs, Intel Capital, um, a lot of great people, Elastic. 
Um, you're going to be doing a little pop-up cube. Big time RSA. Now, someone who else wrote, RSA, the best press release conference of all time, meaning it's a lot of promotion. Um, <laughs> uh, it's because it's really an industry trade show. Uh, it's going to be is happening. You wrote a breaking analysis last week on security budgets. Yep. So take us through your view. You're going to be on the ground with the Cuban media way, media row there. Security budgets are growing. There's a sprawl going on in terms of tools. We thought that would be pulled back with the platforms emerging like Palo Alto networks. Okay. Not so much. Now you got the hype of RSA coming. Give us your take, Dave, and what 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 you see with your analysis, and then what are you expecting to see at RSA? Yeah, so ahead of our, I mean, I love RSA because I'm kind of an RSA newbie. I've only been a few times, and so you know, a lot of people, you know, like if you go to CES every year, you know, they roll their eyes. Oh, another CES, but it's a really exciting show. It's dynamic. You have tons of new entrants. You you got, for instance, last year. Uh, Rubric had a huge presence at RSA. You've got all kinds of new startups. You got Sneak now, you know, angling for an IPO. So there's a lot of really Wiz has like lined out the the back to try to get into their party. All the VCs are there. Insight Capital, you know, Greylock, they all have big events. So ahead of RSA, we we collaborated with ETR to do an RSA survey, and a couple of key findings. First of all. Uh, security budgets are growing. No surprise of anybody, but the but the the magnitude of that growth. Overall, IT budgets probably growing three point four three point five percent this year. At a minimum, security budgets are growing at five percent. Fifteen percent of the survey said they're growing, or fourteen percent of the survey said they're growing by fifteen percent or more. Eighty seven percent of the respondents said they're going to increase budgets this year in the next twelve months, rather. Zero percent of the big spenders, Fortune 100 and S and P 500, said they were going to decrease budget. So it's at least five percent. Could be as as much as seven percent. Multi cloud and ransomware protection, big drivers. But the the big news is when you listen to the narrative of certainly Palo Alto, George Kurtz at CrowdStrike, uh, and some others. They say, look, the value proposition of our company is we're going to consolidate vendors on average. Companies have 50, 60, 75 tools installed. We are the consolidator. That's why we're winning business. So we asked the question, over the next 12 months, do you expect or increase or decrease the number of cybersecurity vendors in your stack? This is over 321 IT decision makers. 51% said increase. 37% said the same, same, stay the same. Only 9% said decrease. And only 6% said consolidation was how they were going to decrease. So there is... Broadly, not a consolidation trend. It's just the opposite. When, when we ask them why you are increasing the number of vendors, they said two things. One is we got to fill gaps. Two is we need best of breed, basically implying that the full stack, you know, full across the portfolio of vendors can't deliver best of breed. They need new tools, new entrants to fill those gaps. And to the last point, AI obviously is going to be hot. You're going to see a ton of sort of AI innovators existing players like Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, Zscaler, a lot of, lot of chops. Everybody in, in security is going to be talking AI, but you're going to have some new entrants that really are born AI. Just like we had cloud native, you're going to have AI native. And I think you're going to hear a lot about that. And there's going to be some real differentiation. There's going to be a lot of AI washing, and there's going to be a big scramble to get attention <laughs> at this event. And of course, yeah. we have our event that we're co-sponsoring with NYSE and yeah. uh, Intel Capital and yeah. Elastic and Open Policy. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, op open Policy is awesome. I, I, I normally do um, RSA. I'm a, I've got a commitment in Denver with Boomi, and I've been really focused on that. Love that Love that company. You, you're going to do great. I wish I could be there. I might pop in Monday. Uh, we'll see. But I'm on the East Coast. My daughter, Caroline, graduates from UNC next week. Tyler graduated. My son, Tyler, from Northeastern this week. So I'm on the East Coast for graduations. I uh, can't miss those awesome moments. But the security no market, Dave, is awesome on fire. Dude, look at look at what's happening. Look at this. Lacework deal uh, to be acquired was collapsing but with Wiz. That's being reported. Security browser company Island raises $175 million, doubling the valuation of $3 billion. We, I interviewed them last year. Love this company. A mm. security browser. I mean, They're coming hey, on the cube. What a great idea. Come on. I love the founder. Love that company. Network security startup Corelight raised $150 million. Citigroup's VC arm invested in AppDynamics, 
Okay, co-founder, um, Apps App Dynamics co-founder, um, uh, Joti API Security Company, Traceable. Okay, another thing, Oasis Security, one of 35 million they raised. Strong DM, 34 million. Trust Center Platform Startup Safe Base raises 33 million. It is a funding bonanza right now for security companies. If you're in the generative AI company and you're in security, your valuation will be triple anything anyone else is getting. I mean, Gen AI and security is the hottest intersection. The nexus of those two areas are so hot right now that the VCs can't get they, – they're fighting for deals left and right. It's like, it's like watching them, like, fight, like, in a cage match. But who's going to lead those rounds? So <laughs> it's, it's – it's, and then Palo Alto Networks launches pre, uh, uh, Sassy 3.0, right? So Palo Alto continues to perform, even though the stock took a hit. Um, Menlo Security inks a deal with Google. It's a major deal time for security. The game is changing. And again, your result, your your analysis blew my mind because I thought the tool sprawl was going to be consolidating when actually it's expanding. And that shows me that the net new security risks are far greater than the budgets, managing the budgets and the consolidation. So it's going to be a lot of pressure on the platform companies, Dave. You know, CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, Fortinet, all the traditional players, uh, um, Sentinel One, uh, all these guys, they have to deal with the new threats. So if you're a startup entrepreneur, security is continuing to be hot. Um, I'm bullish on it in terms of the, uh, the startup side, but it's it's a hard environment. Well, you know, to me, I wasn't surprised that there was a an increase in the number of tools I was surprised at the magnitude uh, of the increase, or actually, I should say, the the lack of 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 consolidation that was going on. So, you know, that says to me that this this market is going to the the dynamics of this market are going to continue sort of indefinitely. Meaning, you're going to have this constant leapfrogging, ping ponging between the adversaries who are highly capable and the defenders who just you know, need better tools. They, they need better skills. Uh, they need AI. You know, I was listening to Larry Ellison the other day. We was talking to the, in that analyst session we were in and he was basically saying, look, humans, we will, we will lose every time, you know, to these, to these AI machines that are attacking us. The only way to do security is, you know, it with machine intelligence. Okay. I buy that, but then applying that is so difficult because where do you apply it? You got to apply it at the silicon. You got to apply it in the database. You got to apply it in the applications. You have to apply it at the devices. You got to <laughs> apply it everywhere. I mean, in the network. I mean, it's just it's security everywhere, and things change so quickly. And it's like, okay, how am I going to automate this, that, the other thing? Patching. It's just it's it's a it's an endless battle. And it's these people are heroes. These are true heroes. Talk about rock stars. You know that commercial workday. Yeah, call me a yeah. rock. You're not a rock star. Oh, uh, these guys could be rock stars in the security business. I'll tell you. So uh, I'm excited for RSA. It's going to be a grind, but I'm really yeah, up. There. Yeah. Well, with the, you got to squint through this. The promotional aspect of it is really important because you see who got the, who has the go to market shops. You see where the promotion is, where the funding is. Then also you have the changing landscape. So I really want to get your take on that. If you look at, if you look at the cloud players too, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as we kind of, you know, have, have come to a wrap here in the next couple of minutes. Um, because if you look at the cloud players, you got reinforced coming up for re uh, AWS. That's a security event. What's the role of the cloud players in security? And then Dave, the earnings just came out. So yep. squinting at the earnings, you got the chip earnings came out that was compelling. You got Amazon's earnings that were compelling. As you look at the earnings as a scoreboard and the CapEx and the security challenge with all the tools expanding and the spending data you're seeing, you're starting to see the role of the monetization of the picks and shovels of this gold rush, the generative AI gold rush. There's going to be massive money-making going on, massive game-changing shift positions. It's like you're going to see like the NASCAR, the car's going to shoot out front, people are going to fall behind. It's going to change positions. It's kind of like the lead in, in, in basketball, right? Like how many times lead change is happening? You're going to start to see people change. And right. Amazon, although they're not the, the growth numbers that Azure has, but their numbers are massive. 
So yeah. what's your take on the cloud players? So the, the first thing is the cloud has become the first line of defense in cybersecurity. And, and there's some good news there and there's some challenging news there because the good news is cloud guys are really good at security. They're, we, we've learned they're better than the vast majority, if not 99% of the, the on-prem um, environment in terms of what they do. The challenge is it's a, it's a shared responsibility model and there's multiple people with that responsibility. And one of those constituents is the developer. Because cloud turned the data center into an API and infrastructure as code, the developer is now uh, tasked with securing that infrastructure. And so that puts a lot of pressure on the developers. Mm -hmm. You know, they just want to write good code and create great products. Now, when you look at the earnings, I mean, everybody is accelerating, right? So Amazon went, mm -hmm. you know, the Amazon accelerated growth um, to 17%. To, to, uh, <laughs> Azure, 31%, up from 28%, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and then you got uh, Google, 26% acceleration. So all three of the big hyperscalers. And then Azure said, or Microsoft said, uh, they had six points last year, last, Q4 last year from, uh, from AI, seven points this year. So they're well over a billion dollars now per quarter in AI. So you, so you are seeing the monetization I would say, but still, most of the monetization is still CapEx build out, going to NVIDIA, going to the LLM vendors. To your earlier point, we still haven't seen the money in the upper layers of the stack, specifically the applications. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be huge. If you look at, if you look at the CapEx investments, Dave, and, and you look at where the AppSock guys are, I think that's going to be the, the bit that flips. When you look at the dollars coming in, I think you'll start to see more money flow into the application layer. And David Chihira from Mongo addressed it in your interview. People are overwhelmed right now, and the VCs are already starting to chirp on this. The consumer side is going to be the key, and the dollars are so big on that side, the infrastructure has to be built. Okay, I expect Amazon's next quarter probably to be stronger, given the fact that they're probably two quarters into their pivot on all mm -hmm. in on Gen AI. So I think we're just starting to see the scratch the surface on Amazon's side. Oracle's engineering infrastructure that we've been covering for years, remember engineered systems, actually has a good opportunity, okay, to pick up some of those workloads. Because at the end of the day, performance will matter. And as connective uh, cloud operations connects, Red Hat, okay, HashiCorp, IBM will play a big role in there. Um, and I think you're going to start to see more formation going on around true foundational infrastructure scale for apps. And that's going to be the tell sign. Um, and again, I think the enterprise will be a lagging um, to, to this consumer. And then it's going to look just like the internet. It's going to pop on the consumer and then shift to the enterprise. The enterprise has always been slower. Even though they're faster now, they're going to be slower because all the application work being done in open source will take some time to bake into the enterprise. It's just too many moving parts, too much legacy, certainly doable. I'm not down on that. I'm just thinking the timing of the costs and the, the revenue with the production that we're seeing won't make it. So, well, you know, I think Am Amazon will, will do well because they play on both sides. I thought Charlie Cowis nailed it when he said at the financial analyst meeting, he said the, the, the ROI for consumer AI is very evident. It's, it's really obvious. You build a bigger AI you know, system, build more clusters in, in AI clusters, GPU clusters, connect them together tune it and you're going to make more money because you're going to social media, you're going to target, you're going to drive more ads. It was interesting. Listen to all in pod guys saying, hey, I'm not so sure about meta, you know, they're spending all this money. <laughs> Meta's building, you know, connecting million GPU clusters and they're going to crush it because they're going to sell more ads. The ROI as Charlie Kawa said, and the enterprise it's fuzzier. It's not as clear. And yet, all the capex that's going out with the hyperscalers right now, and every every company that sells to the enterprise is racing. You got Databricks yeah. and Snowflake doing LLMs. Oracle had a big announcement: the Oracle Twenty Three AI. They're you know one of the probably the biggest database launch ever. And of course, it's Oracle, so they got everything in there. They got vector search, just like Mongo, you know, has has embedded in 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 built vector search inside the database. They got, you know, they're putting AI everywhere on Golden Gate. They got JSON. They got Graph. They got, 
you know, every time series, you name it, they've got mm-hmm. it. And then they got new exadatas. Uh, they announced new MySQL heat waves. It's just enormous amounts of R and D going into product. You know, Oracle is, you know, they're going to actually, I think, do very well with AI uh, because they're now, you know, they've got the applications there. They've got that stack that's, they don't play in semiconductors, but they play in the upper levels of the stack from, from infrastructure, not semis, but infrastructure all the way up to the apps. So I I like that. It's it's, I do too. I think it's clear to me that on the enterprise side, and again, let's put a marker down on this and come back to it on future pods. And I think we'll hit this theme a lot is that if the enterprise, if you buy the fact that the enterprise will be lagging for consumer adoption, then a couple of things will happen. One is, what will the environment look like? It'll look like cloud operations, a.k.a. distributed computing, meaning it's going to run operationally as a cloud, both in public clouds, on-premise, edge, private clouds, whatever. That basically means that applications will adopt an infrastructure as code philosophy and treat infrastructure as a pool of resources, like an operating system. And if Oracle's got some good stuff, they're going to just be a pool of resource. And guess what? They got a lot of workloads on Oracle, right? Oracle database runs a lot of workloads. And that's going to be an opportunity for things like HashiCorp and other companies and other applications like Red Hat. So as the architects reset everything, that's going to be the the exercise. You're going to start to see companies go, okay, I now have an opportunity to reset my entire architecture to run my workloads on the best performant, most efficient, cost-effective infrastructure to supply the best general AI experience. That's going to take about two, three years. And I think you'll see a lot of things happen between the next 24 months leading into that kind of equation. So, again, who wins? Cloud players, Amazon, Azure, Oracle, Google. Check. Middle layer, the data layer, Snowflake, Databricks, others, and or new entrants. Okay. Who wins? Developers. App developers, startups. There's a lot of white space in these areas. So you're going to see people come out of college, start companies. Then you're going to start to more investment come in. So I think that's the, the landscape we're looking at right now. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We've, like you said, we've seen these waves. But you said earlier, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. People are confused. That's the way these waves always are. Because the stock market goes crazy, but the but the actual market for this new stuff isn't big enough to offset the old stuff. And people still have to invest. They still got to keep the lights on. They don't want to over rotate to the new stuff. They're still experimenting. They've they've seen this movie before, where a lot of the stuff they invest in is going to be disposable, and a lot of the companies they're <laughs> investing in are going to go away. You know, yeah. it's, it happens all the time. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. So, you know, it's hard to place these bets. I mean, but you got to play. I, here's what I would bet on. I would definitely bet on AI being infused into applications. I would bet on data. I would bet on managements that can execute <laughs> and have a track record. I would bet on companies that have a massive TAM and a CEO who understands yeah. TAM expansion. Th- those are where you want to place your bets. Um, yeah. yeah. So. And, and to connect it, to, to end, the, end the pod on episode 57, I would say connecting the dots, I would say that I like this enterprise narrative of being slower than the consumer. I think it's easy to connect the dots and watch the formation happen and then watch the onboarding of all that innovation and wealth creation market movement that will happen. Number two, I really see the dots connecting on crypto. I think Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others will be standardized. You start to see a resurgence of crypto. I think, Dave, you and I were talking about that briefly a few pods ago. You start to to see that. And why I say that is because CZ from Binance just got four months in jail after the other guy got decades or whatever. So finance guy who's done billions of billions of dollars in, in, in wealth creation for himself as, as well as the world, four months in jail. That tells me that there's some shit going down there that he caught the plea. Okay. Meaning four months in jail, he knows something means mean that we're going to see finance come back. So it's already been reported by the verge that there's going to be an independent American, probably SEC person inside the facility, that means if that happens, you start to see the, the retail crypto market emerge again quickly. So if that happens, if that dot connects, global trade on, on, on crypto, that should pop the Bitcoin price big time and then change the developer equation back to what we wanted to see with Ethereum and others, where you see a lot more developer action in crypto. So I think you'll see crypto come out of its nuclear winter, which has been really bad. 
And I think that's going to come back. So those are the two areas. Obviously, AI, well, you know, I feel about chat well, AI. I think that, well, that's crypto, already connected. You know, as you know, crypto hit an all-time high, right? but Bitcoin did. Ethereum didn't hit like 73,000. And then, you know, you saw recently, I mean, all my crypto friends were freaking out. Ah, crypto's in the 50s. Ah, what's happening? Bitcoin's in the 50s. And I'm like, I don't know. It's 62 Just today, relax. I think. Relax. Now it's back, it's back up, up right? So it, well, it, you got this. I think we talked about this in the Cube Pod. You've got, you got the 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 believers who are in it for the long term and you got the guys who are kind of in and out in and out and you got these two counterposed you know folks that think it's a it's a store of value and they're just going to keep it there and others are just trying to trade the volatility but look at crypto is is the greatest asset class in the history of asset classes period i mean it's it that, that's, outpaces, a, that's, a, that's a bold it, statement Dave. but it's true it's, all, that, well, that is, that is mean, a fact we, now so so I got to well, run the probabilities. What's the probability that Bitcoin just vaporizes and goes to zero? There's a probability could happen. You know, I, I, I wouldn't say it's high, but I, you know, let's, let's say you give it 10%. What's the probability that 10 years from now, crypto is going to be higher. You significantly higher than it is today. Let's, let's call it double or more. I would say the probability is, I don't know, you give it 60. I think the probability, I think the probability is double. The probability is high. The, what we don't know about crypto, and this is wait, wait, why wait. I'm watching. Let me, just, let, me just, let me just say one more thing. So you play the probabilities, okay? And, and you know, there's probability that sort of trades in a range. Don't, don't buy crypto on margin, okay? Don't buy crypto. But don't put your entire savings in crypto, okay? But yeah, learn yeah. about it. Learn about it because well, I, it I is think our the, the legit, greatest really, asset really, in the history of assets. Well, I, I think people should diversify in its asset class for sure. But here's the thing about crypto that I think: if you look at the price, go back in this decade. I mean, we're living in, 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 in an amazing time. We've got a Cambrian explosion on generative AI and infrastructure changeover. The script flipping. We just talked about that. If you look at crypto coming out of its nuclear winter, okay, from, a, from all the fraud market that was, you know, the first underbelly that took over. If you look at the price of, say, Bitcoin, just go back 10 years, just this decade, it's significant. Look at all the Bitcoin billionaires that are going to start to emerge out of this liquidation phase and start deploying their capital into other asset classes, real estate, venture funds, other things. Now, as a global backbone with the government getting into Binance, you have to see a, now a, a new global backbone infrastructure for liquidity. That means net new cash is coming in from billionaires that were created from people buying it at a dollar. $10, $100, $1,000. So if you put a, a hundred thousand or a million into Bitcoin and a thousand, do the math, the numbers are off the charts. You now are sitting on tons of profit. That's going to come into the market. That's going to change and disrupt the market system as in the asset class. So this is a very interesting area. What we don't know is how much control of the whales or the Bitcoin holders will have on that. So these so-called whales, people hold massive amounts of Bitcoin. If they deploy, does that collapse the market and change the pricing? So we don't yet know what a free market trading system looks like under Bitcoin. That's the wild card on this. So to me, my caveat is until we start to get visibility on the trading dynamics of whales dumping and liquidity, we won't know it. But I do agree with you that over the next 10 years, it'll probably double or triple. So that's the, that, that, that I would... I would say yeah, so, you can connect that dot. So so learn how to trade crypto if you don't you know, put some money in, not too much. Do not trade on margin. I, I think you got to think of Bitcoin as, you know, the digital gold, the store of, of value. And you think of Ethereum as the technology of of crypto. And then, you know, things like Solana and there's all there's all kinds of other sort of other, <laughs> there's a lot of shit coins out there. I, I don't own shit coins. Well, I Dave, honor, I got to. It Great to chat. Monday. I, I got a roll to my next graduation party with my son. Oh, awesome. And, Congratulations uh, to Tyler yeah. and your family. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, That's a really you. exciting time, John. I appreciate it. And uh, again, we'll see you next week. Uh, I might see you Monday. I might fly back in the S7 and then pop back out to Denver, but I'll be also be in North Carolina for UNC's moves, graduation man. next weekend. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <All right. laughs> Look at that flight right, right have now. Fun in, uh, have, have fun in Boston and, and in Denver. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah. Yeah. check out, so, check out SiliconAngle.com. That's where all the action is. Uh, for Dave and Dave, I'm John Furrier. Thanks for listening and enjoy the week. Bye, everybody.